Good morning. I'm so glad you joined me today. Welcome. As you can see, I'm not in my usual place. I am um, so blessed to be able to have come to Virginia and spending some time with a friend there. And so I'm up in the mountains of Virginia and enjoying this wonderful cabin. So thank you, Ellen and Gary, for letting me come. I really appreciate that. But we want to talk today about trusting God. That's a big subject to try and unpack in half an hour, but we're going to give it a shot. And I'm um, in Living Beautifully, Practical Proverbs for Women. This is week three, day two, trusting God. So let's start by um, with prayer. Father God, we do come before you. Father, we all need to grow in this area of faith, of trust, of remembering that who you are, that you are the creator, that you are still on your throne. And Father, that in, in the chaos of our lives, you are still in control and you still love us with an everlasting love. When we can't understand, it's because we can't always see eternity in your purpose. Help us to just lay in your hands and rest. Father, I thank you for each woman listening today, and I pray that you would just bless their families and their lives, and that they would grow through the hearing of your word. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so something major happens. It's catastrophic. How do you react? What is your response? Are you throwing yourself on the floor, crying and weeping at once? Do you pick up the phone and call your best friend? Do you um, get angry, start hitting things and, and kicking things? Or do you just give up and say, well, forget this. I just can't do this anymore. Um, do your thoughts go to the negative side or, or beginning to um, wonder what if this happens and this happens and your thoughts start spiraling downwards? Or maybe you just are one of those who try to just get busy and try and fix it. Well, we live in this world, and God has promised us that we will have troubles and tribulations, even as Christians. But the good news is he promises us that he will go through it with us, and he will always be with us. And so we need to learn to trust in him, even when we don't understand why, why he's allowing something to happen in our lives, even when our thoughts are spiraling, when we're not sure what to do, um, we need to rest and trust. And that is not our first um, indica indication, our, our first um, response usually to a catastrophe. Usually we do one of those other things first. But we need to first get on our knees and say, okay, God, you've got this. I know you've got it. So today we're going to be focusing on the passage in Proverbs 3, 1 through 10, and specifically on verses 5 and 6. Now these are key pin verses to the entire chapter or the entire book of Proverbs, as well as the entire book of the Bible. If someone were just given Proverbs 3, chapter, verses 5 and 6, they could, and practice that every day, they could be well on their way to living a life of peace and joy through Jesus Christ. These are such key verses, and some of you, I'm sure, have them memorized. So let's start with verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 10, and then we're going to go back and uh, look at those verses 5 and 6. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So we see here that with everything, we're to trust God with all of our heart. And in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter six, we see with all of our heart, with all of our might, with all of our strength, um, we're to trust him and lean on him because he is able. So when I, when I start thinking about trusting in God, my mind always goes immediately to a movie I watched years ago. Some of you may have seen it. It's Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. You didn't know that there was sermon right there in that, that movie. Um, about halfway through the movie, there is a trolley. No one is on this trolley except an old lady. And she is sitting in the very front seat of the trolley. And she's just sitting there knitting, minding her business, just at peace, smiling, and just, just happy as can be. But the trolley is going all over the place. It's about to go over a cliff. It's about to run up a mountain. It's about to go into the sea. And it, it's all over. The, it's chaotic. And here she sits, nice and peacefully. And that has become the picture of what I want to be in the chaos of life. I want to have my trust in God so firm 
that no matter what is thrown at me, no matter where my trolley's headed, I'm at peace in the midst of it. And so that's always a picture to me. Um, I read across a verse in Isaiah. I love this verse. It's Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. And it's really a great uh, definition of faith um, and in trust and what it should look like. It says this, for thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, in repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Now again, those are not usually our first responses to trouble. But when we can get to that place where we can just in repentance and rest, we will be saved. And in quietness and trust, we will be strong. We'll be strong in the Lord. We'll be strong in our faith. We'll be strong in, in his presence, even in the midst, and thus able to share him with others. So um, I began wondering, okay, I'm going to trust somebody. What characteristics does somebody need to have for me to trust them? Well, I want somebody, I want to trust somebody who has a good track record. They've shown themselves to be trustworthy. Um, they have a reputation of keeping things to themselves, of, of holding confidences. They have a um, rat track, track record or reputation of being able to hold on to that which you tell them. The second one is I'm, I'm going to go and ask testimonies of others. What, what have you known about this person? Have you heard of this person before? What is, what is that track record? What is their reputation? Um, I would want them to have consistency in all areas of their lives. So if they're on... Um, Sunday being the Christian and in church and, and being holy and everybody's coming to them, but I see them at the bar on Wednesday, I probably wouldn't trust them nearly as much. I want to see that consistency. I want to be able to keep them to be able to keep things in confidence or private, um, be able to keep their word. If they tell me something, if they say they're going to be here at eight o'clock, I would expect them to be there at eight o'clock. And trustworthy um, position, holding a trustworthy position. It's somebody who has gone through the ranks. They've got some experience behind them. They, they've been trusted with much um, in their position, maybe in their career or in the church, or even as a um, wife and a mother being over young women. So I would look for those things. So I began to say, okay, does God fulfill each of those things? First of all, does he have a good track record and a reputation? I love it when you talk to somebody and they say, oh, God of the Old Testament is just a God of judgment. And, you know, he was just an angry God. I know right then and there that they've never read the Old Testament. Because if you read the Old Testament, you see a God of grace, of long suffering, of um, he put up with his people for hundreds and thousands of years, turning their back on him, turning their back. And all he wanted to do was to pour out his grace and, and mercy on him. And of course, finally, eventually he gave his very own son to live on this earth, to be, to be apart from him in some ways and, and, and to walk on this life in perfect perfectness and then be laid at the cross for our salvation so we see a god who is trustworthy we see his track record and even in my own life i can go back and say remember when remember when we had this need and god provided remember when i was i was hurting and god showed me his hand remember when he put his arms around me and i can look back at the track record even in my own life and throughout um, especially the psalms but throughout scriptures you'll see the word remember Remember the God who did these things, who, who spread wide the Red Sea for his people to cross on dry land. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that's the God we serve. He is trustworthy because of his track record and his reputation. And testimonies of others. We have 66 books of the Bible. We have testimonies of people throughout history, missionaries, um, George Mueller, who ran orphanages over in England and often didn't have even the next meal for his his orphans and, and God would bring one time I'll never forget a, a milk truck that broke down right in front of the orphanage and of course back then it was in the um, late 1800s the milk would have spoiled so he gave all, all the yogurt milk everything he had to the orphanage while somebody could come and fix his truck um, so God provides God provides and we see that in testimonies of others ask ask others so tell me about your journey with Jesus and it's amazing the things that you will hear. Everyone has a story. Um, consistency in all areas of their lives. We see this consistency with God. We see his consistency um, throughout scripture, throughout our lives, um, throughout um, history. We see his consistency. We may not always understand it, 
we don't understand when our loved ones are pass away or when someone has to go through a terrible circumstance or pain. We don't understand it. We don't always see the eternal perspective of it, but we do know that God is consistent in all things and he has a purpose and is able to hold us and keep us through those. And the people who hold on to their trust and their strength in those times will find just the peace of God. They'll find that Jesus is walking right there next to him. And they'll find that, yes, they grieve. Yes, they'll miss this person. Yes, they, they are still in pain. Yes, they, they don't know if they're going to be able to get up tomorrow or not. But they're okay with that because they know their God. And their God is able and has a purpose and a plan. Um, God who's able to keep things confident in private. We can pour out our hearts to God. We can tell him our deepest sorrows. He already knows every word that comes out of our mouth. He knows our minds. He knows everything about us. We're not going to surprise him with anything. So we're able to do that with God. He keeps his promises. If you go through the promises of the Old Testament, um, showing that Jesus was coming not just for the Jewish nation, the Israel nation, but also for all mankind, that he's bringing his light to the nations. We see that all of that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And we look and see the prophecies that are coming and we can know that he's going to keep those promises. And he keeps his promises to us in our lives. And then, of course, a trustworthy position. What could be more trustworthy than the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator God, the one who made it all, who holds it all in his hands. Every breath is because of him. Um, he has got this. He is on his throne. And there's a verse in Psalms. I don't have it written down which Psalm it is. It says God is on his throne during the flood, and he's still on his throne today. And that just brings so much comfort to me because the flood was the greatest chaos that ever happened in our world. Um, mountains were thrust up and valleys were made and water dashed all over the world. And yet God was on his throne. He had a purpose in it. He had a plan in it. He wasn't blindsided by it. He knew what was coming. And that's something I always remember when those things come is God's not surprised. He's got this. He already knew it was coming. Um, we had a situation in our life where um, I really had to follow up on the verses in Philippians 4. I think it's, I, I don't have that one pulled up either. I should have. But it says, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, make your, your request known to God. And the peace that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And this person that was very, very close to me was just going through a very tough time. And I could not help them. I could not reach out and give them what they needed. I, could, I didn't want to enable them. I also just physically couldn't. They lived many, many, well, around, halfway around the world at that time. But I could pray, and I could put my anxious thoughts in the hands of Jesus. So every time their name came to my mind, I would immediately pray for them. First of all, it was practically every minute. Then after a while, a couple times an hour, an hour, and then several times a day. And at the same time, um, my husband was able to walk with this person through some of this and, and just give them some, okay, the next thing you need to do is this. Okay, next thing you need to do is this. And he got through that and is thriving and surviving. And God did give me the peace that passes understanding in the midst, as he promised there, us there in Philippians. So on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And yet, when we go to the cross, we tend to pick up more burden than he ever meant for us to. A lot of us think our salvation is based upon not just the cross, but the cross and the cross and my church attendance, cross and my behavior, the cross and tithing, the cross and my Bible study, the cross and, and, and. What about you? What are you adding to that it is finished for your salvation? Are you depending on, on works of your own or are you truly trusting in the cross? It is finished. There at the cross, when Jesus says it is finished, anyone who comes to him and believes that he is the Lord and speaks with their mouth, um, he will bring salvation. And at that point, this is what he says. And I'm over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 in verse 1. It says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I'm going to read a little bit more there in just a minute. Um, now, if you're reading from the King James Version, you can see I probably skipped a little bit there. And it's well documented that a scribe in the fourth century decided that that was not enough, that was too much grace. That that was, people would look at that and run, run wild with it. So he took part of verse four down below and added it to verse one. And so 
in your King James Version, it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But the truth is, even when we're walking in the flesh, if we're born again, if we have claimed it is finished and it's a done deal, we are justified through Christ. We'll go back a couple of lessons. We talked about what does it mean to be justified. Uh, it means to be legally stamped that I am not guilty. And it goes in a file and I never have to be judged again. So when we come before the cross, it is finished. Now, in my flesh, I will still sometimes as I'm growing, as I'm maturing in Christ, I will sin. I will, and sometimes it's very blatant. But God says there is therefore now no condemnation. Yes, I need to repent and turn from that and confess that to him for our relationship so that we can be reconciled again to one another and can walk with God again. But there's nothing that we can do to pull us out of that relationship, that childhood with Jesus Christ. I was reading in Isaiah today, and um, it says in, if I can find it here, Bert, I was in chapter 40, 41, 42. Here it is. It is on chapter 49, verse 16. Behold, I have subscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God writes our names on his palms and he never erases those. So if you're in Christ, you can't be taken out of Christ. Just that relationship could be broken. I want to read a little bit farther in chapter 8 of Romans. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are, according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are, who are, according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So in our own fleshly action, in our works, in trying to be good enough for God, in trying to, to outserve everybody else at the church, in all those things, that does not please God. The only thing that pleases God is our faith, our trust in him, our trust in Jesus Christ. At the cross, it was finished. And we have to don't have to add anything to that. Praise God. And that is what grace is all about. That is where the grace of God comes in. And because of our gratitude, because the Holy Spirit's conviction, because we wanted to please this God, now as his children, we want to walk in his ways. and We want to do good things. And the Spirit controls us and teaches us how to do that through the reading of his word and the relationship with him. So for just a minute, let's look at what is the opposite of trust? The opposite of trust is fear. So what do you fear? What are your fears? Are you afraid of failure? Are you afraid of not being accepted? Maybe you're afraid of public speaking. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Um, maybe you're afraid of, you fill in the blank. What is your fear? All of those areas that you could put, I'm afraid of blank, and you could fill that in. Any of those areas are areas that you're not trusting God with. Maybe it's finances. I, I worked with a lady, godly woman. Oh my goodness, she was, she was just, she loved the Lord. But she was really struggling. Um, she and her husband had been in full-time missionary service, ministry service all of their lives. And she was struggling trusting God for retirement, for their later days when he could no longer preach, when he could no longer work, he could no longer counsel. And she had she really struggled through that because her future was, you know, in that. How, how are we going to survive um, when we can no longer do those things? And she finally got to the point of realizing that that fear was keeping her from trusting God that he'd been faithful all those years. He wasn't equipped being faithful now here at the end of their lives. Um, maybe it's the fear of the future. I share in this, this chapter, a time when I'm, I was in bed just in so much pain and, and saying, God, I can't, I can't do this for 20 more years, 10 more years, five more years, another month, another week, another day. God, I can't. And he said, I didn't ask you to. He said, I ask you to do it right now, right here. And I'm with you. And when I stay in that, I'm, I am at peace. 
And when I stay in the moment, I stay in the day, I know my God is with me and he gets me through each one. But when I let my mind go off into the fear of the future and the prognosis the doctors have given me and da 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 da, that fear comes in. And I had to realize that day that, look, Jesus was Lord of my life, my present, and I had made him the Lord of my past, but I had not yet really given lordship over to Jesus for my future. And so through a process, um, I've now done that. We need to face our fears. We need to face our fears and realize that God is bigger than any situation, any person, that anything that puts fear in our hearts. God is bigger. And those are the testing grounds. That is where God says, okay, it's a, it, faith is a muscle. Trust is a muscle. Let's see if you can muscle through this one. Not on your own, but through your trust in God. Can you get through it? And as you do, then your faith grows. Your trust grows. Your, his, God's track record in your life gets a little bit better and you'll be able to turn to him more and more. And so there's nothing that um, God can't handle. In um, Second Peter, turn back there. That's right after Hebrews, James, first and second Peter. In Second Peter, God says this. Um, maybe it's in First Peter. Well, I know it was here. Therefore, let's see. Here it is. Second Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. We shouldn't be surprised when hard things come into our lives. Again, Jesus promised trials and tribulations. But God is not surprised by them either. And he knows this. And he says, by that suffering, you're being tested. You're, you're being made to grow closer to him. And we've got to remember that eternal perspective. We're on this earth to grow and develop and, and, and practice being in that relationship with Jesus, practice being in that trust. Because it says that when we go to heaven, we're going to be judging angels. We're going to be judging nations. Uh, he's got jobs for us to do. He's preparing us now for that eternity. And so sometimes we don't understand in the here and now. We don't understand here in this world why God allows something. But he's got the eternal perspective and knows what he wants for us in the future. And we need to be walking with him and being allowing him to prepare, be preparing us for what is to come. Um, there was a time in my life that I, uh, well, I found out that my, grand, my daughter-in-law was going to have a baby girl. And I should have been so excited. I had five boys. Our first two grandchildren were boys. And all of a sudden, I'm going to have a big grandbaby girl in my life. Instead, my heart turned to fear. It turned to fear because of some of the abuse of my own past. And I thought, I can't protect a little girl, as if that was my job anyway. But as grandma, you know, that's, that's important. And, um, of course, it was on the way to a women's retreat that I was going to be teaching. And, of course, I was going to be teaching on spiritual warfare. And so right then and there, Satan just nailed me. And that fear just rose to the top. And I prayed. I prayed through the night. The next morning, I, I was crying and, and just really upset. I knew I shouldn't be by myself. So I went over to the prayer room. And I sat down. And, and I was just turned to the next psalm that was in my reading as I was reading the psalms every day. I was reading through the psalms. And um, I sat there reading Psalms chapter 40. And as I read, I continued to weep and cry and lay this before the Lord and just wrestle with God, saying, I, got, I can't protect her. How can, how can I protect her? What can I do? And this fear was just rising up within me. I cried for about two hours there. Some hand kept handing me tissues. I still to this day don't know who that was, <laughs> but I was so appreciative. Um, Psalms 40 says this, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon a rock making my footsteps firm he put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our god many will see and fear and will trust in the lord how blessed is the man who has made the lord his trust has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood many O lord my god are the wonders which you have done in your thoughts toward us there is none to compare with you if i would declare and speak of them they would be too numerous to count God loves you. He wants what's best for you. He's going to work things for your good in your life and for your eternity. Um, he has got you in his hands. His not, we can't even begin to count the number of thoughts that he has for us. 
and he can lift us up out of that miry clay and we can trust him even when we don't understand. And it's okay to cry out to him. He knows, he understands our human frame, our, our thoughts, our fears. But until those fears turn into trust, we can't go forward, we'll be stuck. And so that day as I sat in that um, prayer room with others around me and praying for me, I know, and handing me tissues, um, I was able to finally give that to the Lord. And I'm, now I have three granddaughters. We're absolutely loving it. And I've learned to trust him with these precious grandchildren. And so whatever your fear is, take it to the Lord. Cry out to him. Let him help you to overcome that fear and rest and find peace in his hands through trusting God with your life. May you be blessed this day. And I will see you um, next week.